Welcome back to The Phone Booth. I'm your host, Joe Pollard. Before we begin our show, I would like to take a moment to thank our newest patrons. To Andrew Macaruso, Best Maine, George Stankow, and Luke Scribner, thank you. If you would like to support our show, become a patron at www.patreon.com slash foolsgallery. We have a few amazing new rewards for our patrons, my favorite being exclusive access to a secret full-length episode of The Phone Booth. We understand that this is a financially trying time for all of us, so only give what you can. Over the past week, I found myself looking at a framed picture that hangs on the wall of my office. The picture is of a small bar, candlelight flickering to illuminate a crowd of dark shapes huddled around a small stage. Above them all sits a figure hunched over a large guitar. Though his face is obscured by poor lighting, it's obvious who the musician is, because he floats three feet off the ground. I'm sure you've seen the picture. It has become one of the more indelible images of the post-B-Day world, gracing the walls of an entire generation of teenagers. It is an image of the Crossroads Bar in Nashville, Tennessee, the birthplace of a musical revolution that gave us legends like Manfred Jones, Rosalind Rhea, Jeremiah Riles, and of course, Georgia. I must admit that as a depressed teenage adolescent who felt left behind by a world that had taken flight, the music made in that bar saved my life. A fact I couldn't help but tell the writer of the following episode when I contacted him. Archibald Turn, the large, charming, and often drunk owner of the Crossroads Bar, waved my adulation aside. He, as he will say many times in the following episode, didn't do anything. And now, without further ado, let's take another step inside the phone booth for the first episode of our second season, Crossroads, Part 1. I'm not the owner of the Crossroads Bar. Never was. Before B-Day, Crossroads was a sandwich shop called the Twisted Tomato. They had this special where they threw bacon, apple, chicken, and this weird garlicky mayo on homemade honey oat bread. I wake up some nights, my mouth watering, knowing I would trade the entire Crossroads movement for one more bite of the Twisted Tomato special. At least sandwiches don't tear your heart out. But the creators of that shop are long gone. They closed up a few weeks before B-Day, boarded up the windows, locked the doors, and disappeared. Never found out why they left, but I'm thankful they did. Because I wouldn't have made it otherwise. People ask me if I knew what Crossroads would become when I first saw her. I laugh in their face. I'd have to be insane to imagine something like that. No. All I saw when I broke the lock on the front door was a place to squat that was maybe a bit safer than the streets. It was three days after B-Day and the world was burning. There was no police, no National Guard, hell, no government. Hell, the President of the United States of America dissolved into a floating cloud of gas on national television. And then, when you thought that was the scariest shit you'd ever seen, the power went out. Electricity gone on the first day. Looting started on the second. Riots on the third. It was like the book of Genesis in reverse. Becca only knows what would happen on the seventh day. And boy, did people go mad. There didn't seem to be a single unshattered window in the whole city. And if you pass one by, you'd feel obligated to throw a brick just on principle. Hungry anatropes roamed the streets with hungrier humans hunting them. I didn't know which one was more dangerous, so I avoided them both. And with her boarded up windows and locked doors, the Twisted Tomato seemed as good a place as any to wait out the apocalypse. I didn't sleep that first night. Too much noise. Too many people in the streets, breaking into shops, taking what they could get and fighting for what they couldn't. The next morning, the riots had stopped, but I could feel eyes on the streets, waiting for some idiot to venture out. I saw an old man walk down the sidewalk, only to get dragged off by a bunch of fire-breathing youngsters. The city was forming into gangs, and being out in the open was just inviting violence. So I decided to stay in. Safest way forward. I made the twisted tomato my fortress, and if any schmucks tried to take it from me, I'd make them pay with their lives. There was a good set of knives in the kitchen, and a fair amount of canned food in the pantry, but the biggest find, and I mean the biggest find, 
was a banged-up old piano molded into the back of the stage. Her top was covered in a thick layer of melted candles, and she still worked. Kept me alive longer than any food ever could. I was a bit of a musician back in my day. Played saxophone in a blues band called Better Luck Next Time, and could stumble through a few songs on the piano. But I'll tell you, my first thought at the sight of this beautiful instrument was that it was perfect for barring the door. But thankfully, the old bitch was too stubborn to be moved. She seemed to be welded into that stage, and no matter how hard I pushed, she pushed me right back. I gave up and began shoving tables against the door. Then I waited. Days passed. Figures walked by the shop, tried the doors, and then decided it wasn't worth it. Gunshots rang out every few hours. Anatropes howled back and forth with voices that had never existed before. But then, between all the noise, came a silence. This horrible silence that gave way as off in the distance a scream would build from nothing, grow louder and louder only to be cut short by a sickening crunch as flyer hit pavement. It was its own kind of music in a way. The music of the world ending. And I had no other choice but to listen. It was enough to drive a man mad. And maybe it did. For weeks I sat in the Twisted Tomato, the songs of Armageddon replaying again and again. And then one night, I just couldn't take it anymore. I lit the piano candles, pulled up a stool, and began to play. If I had to listen to music, it might as well be Ray Charles. I played, man. I played the old stuff, the good stuff. I didn't play it well, but it didn't matter. I played it all the same. And as Ray's music filled the room, the rest of the world dropped away. I forgot that there were monsters out there in the night. Forgot that I was putting myself at risk by lighting a candle and making some sound. I forgot about all my worries. Because that's what music does. It puts your fears out in the world so you don't have to deal with them alone. No one came to kill me that night. So the next night, I lit the candles back up and went back to the piano. Once again, I lost myself in the music. Did a little Stevie Wonder, but stuck mostly to Ray. I was halfway through Georgia on my mind when a voice came in through the window in perfect harmony. I stopped playing, but the voice continued. It was clear and beautiful and didn't need an instrument to bring tears to my eyes. The voice finished the song alone and then fell away, leaving the silence all the more empty without it. I moved to the window and looked out into the street. There, sitting with her back to my door, was a girl. She was large and broad-shouldered, in her early twenties, and when she looked up and our eyes met, I couldn't help but open the door and let her inside. I asked where she was from, but she didn't answer. I asked what her powers were, but she didn't answer. I asked her name, but she didn't answer. There were thin cuts on her shoulder and belly that looked intentional. I was about to ask whose intention held the knife, but our eyes met and I could tell she wouldn't answer. So instead, I moved back to the piano and began to play. First piece that came to mind was... Am I blue? I settled in, and after a few beats, she joined. In all the years that I would listen to her voice, I never found a way to describe it. But I'll try again here. It was a voice that gave sound to emotion you didn't know you had. Low and husky, it was a voice that you could hang your coat on, only to have it burn up as you turned away. She sang only the oldies. But it didn't matter what the song was, because her voice communicated a feeling that words weren't designed to translate. See, I'm shit. But in the end, I don't have to describe her voice. You've heard it yourself. Because after I finished playing, she moved to the door, stopping just long enough to whisper, You can call me Georgia. Yeah, that's right. That Georgia. I stopped playing for the night. Music without Georgia seemed an empty thing. But when the next night swung around, I sat down at the piano and began to play, with nothing but Georgia on my mind. I left the door open, wanted her to feel welcome. Didn't even think of the other types that might make themselves too welcome. But only Georgia came. Silently, she sidled up to me, and we played every song I knew, just one after the other after the other, her voice never tiring. It was all I could do to keep up. When I stopped to crack my back, Georgia slid into my place, rested her fingers on the keys, and began to play. And I knew. 
I knew I was just holding her back. I took the tables out from behind the door and set them up around the room. Then I placed a few chairs around them, sat down, rested my head on my hand, and listened. But I wasn't the only one. After a few songs, a tiny pale face peeked its way out from behind the doorway. I didn't notice at first until I looked up and found an eight-year-old boy sitting beside me, his legs swinging in time to the music. I almost asked him his name, but the boy's eyes reminded me of George's, so I said nothing. I didn't know then, but I just accidentally created the most important rule of Crossroads. Never ask. Always listen. Finally, Georgia finished, letting her hands fall to her side. The boy disappeared, and Georgia soon followed, nodding her thanks as she vanished into the dark. I closed the doors behind her. I didn't understand until months later that the Crossroads Bar had just had its first performance with its first audience. And I hadn't even come up with a name yet. I cleaned the room the next day. I knew they would be back, and somehow I knew more would come. I could still hear the gunshots, the anatropes stalking, the screams growing and ending. But I knew they wouldn't touch me. Didn't make much sense, but when you're in the midst of something special, there's nothing going to get in the way of that. I fished a ladder and a bucket of old paint out of the back room and spent the day painting a name on my new bar. The Crossroads, where Robert Jordan sold his soul to the devil in exchange for a little skill on the guitar. I knew that was a trade I would make every day of the week and twice on Sunday. God be damned, give me music. It was a good name. Didn't think it would come to mean what it did, though. Georgia came back that night. The kid came as well with an old woman who sat in the corner and silently cried for the whole set, then left without saying a word. They all left in the end, each one disappearing into the night as if they didn't exist anywhere else but in the bar. But the next night they came back, and the next, and the next, until the tables were filled and they started sitting on the floor. More performers came. Giant, bare-chested Manfred Jones with his tiny ukulele became my bouncer, crushing anyone who caused trouble in a hug that would crack your spine. Then there was pretty Sammy Little. Not a true artist like the rest of them, but that was okay. He liked fitting words together to help someone out of their clothes. I used to tell him his smile would do that just as easy, but he seemed to think a poem was more fun. The only woman I ever saw hate Sammy was tiny Doris Parker. She was a real poet, but never as popular, short and squat as she was. Didn't have the voice for it either. But I take some comfort in the fact that her books are finally getting the recognition they deserve, even if she's no longer around to enjoy it. Every night I would open my doors and they would come. They would come for the music, for the company, for the few hours of safety I could provide. They tipped in food, and somehow we all made enough to feed ourselves. That was enough in those days. But only if you followed the rules. There were only three rules at Crossroads. Never ask, always listen, and of course, no powers. Powers led to violence. You only had to look at the world to know that. So I outlawed them at the door. Crossroads was an anti beko Orlovsky establishment, probably the reason she's still standing. The only time you saw powers was if someone caused trouble. Then I'd set Manny on them. And you only had to hear Manny's power once to never want to hear it again. It was a decision that was purely practical for me, but artists like to look for meaning where there isn't any. I think it was Doris who said it. Powers were ripping the world apart and stitching it back together with new hierarchies, societies, and cultures. Before B-Day, every human being was just the same. Two arms, two legs, one voice, born equal. But now, that wasn't the case. Powers made the world unequal. They put some above others. But at crossroads, you left all that at the door. It was a place where no one was above and no one below. All equal, underneath music. If you listened to the rules, you were allowed into the only working bar in all of Nashville, where you could sit and watch the brightest stars of the future perfect their craft. There were some names you'd recognize and some names you wouldn't. But they all started at crossroads, and they all formed a line behind their leader, behind Georgia. She was the closer. She was untouchable. No matter who went up on that stage, she always ended the night and blew them all away. She rarely spoke to anyone, never giving more information than she had to. 
I didn't know where she lived, if she had family, what her power was, or even if Georgia was her real name. None of us did. But we didn't need to. Because when Georgia sang, we knew her inside and out. A year passed, and then another. The world was still a wreck, but things were looking up for us. We were able to pry some solar panels off a farmhouse, giving Crossroads electricity for the first time since the collapse. It allowed us to use a stage light for the bar on nights when the candles ran low. But that wasn't what was exciting. Because with electricity came recordings. Sammy Little took care of it. He broke into an old recording studio, taking a mic, a boom pull, and a record player. I thought it was stupid, but when he showed me a stack of square polycarbonate plastic, I began to understand. Electricity meant recording. Recording meant vinyl. Vinyl meant sales. And sales meant money. I was sold, and gave Sammy all the space he needed to get it going. I'm not too sure on the process, but it involves Sammy and the use of lighter fluids, so I left him to his business. Sure enough, a few weeks later, Sammy had a stack of crossroad vinyls ready for sale. They didn't look much like the records of old. They were square, small, and see-through, but damn if they didn't work. Sammy slipped them into a paper sleeve with a picture of the bar on the front and began to sell. We thought it was a fun way to make a quick buck. Money had just started mattering again and we were sick of eating out of our tip jar. But neither me nor Sammy thought it would catch on like it did. Those records swept over Nashville like wildfire. You could hear Manfred's baritone or George's alto coming from every window in the city. Sammy stopped performing and started pumping them out full time. I didn't know who he kept selling them to. It didn't seem like there was that many people left in Nashville. But they weren't staying in the city. These records had legs, traveling far beyond the city limits, out of Tennessee for Becca's sake. People were listening and they were hungry for more. We started recording new sets, but couldn't make them fast enough. Pretty soon, we were making more money than we ever had before B-Day. I set Sammy up on the second floor, and he stayed up there all night, just printing music. People ask how I explain the popularity of that first record. I just shrug. It's pretty obvious. After the apocalypse, there wasn't any music. And then suddenly there was. Simple as that. We heard of copycat bars springing up all over the country, of house parties where they would just sit around the record player and listen on repeat. People started showing up in Nashville, wide-eyed, trembling, with a guitar on their back. When we asked where they had come from, they said that we were breaking the rules. Never ask, always listen. But we understood what they were about. Nashville had become the holy land of music again. Crossroads had become its mecca. And these kids, who had traveled across the burning hellscape of what remained of America, were on the last legs of their pilgrimage. This has been a Fool's Gallery production of The Phone Booth. Crossroads Part 1 was written and directed by Keenan Ellis. In Part 2, out June 1st, Archie talks about the next generation of Crossroads performers, and of course, the relationship between its two greatest stars.